So if you brought your Bibles, we're in Exodus chapter 4, verse 28. If you would, please stand in honor of God's Word. Listen to verse 28. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and, to, and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that they looked upon their affliction, that they bowed their heads and they worshiped. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how it just seems to leap off the page into our hearts. And God, you instruct us, you teach us. And God, it's so exciting to be in a, in, in a house full of people that are worshiping you and lifting our voices in praise. And God, it's our simple prayer that our worship has been a sweet-smelling savor before your throne. God, that we have truly recognized your unseen presence, that we've opened our ears to listen to your Holy Spirit speak to our hearts, and that, God, we are willing to obey what you ask us to do. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving us. May you be glorified, O oh God, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So as we begin this morning, I, I just want you to realize that as I preach through a book like in the Old Testament, that I don't go word for word for word for word and point out everything that God has revealed to me. Because if I did that, we would probably be here till two or three in the afternoon, and y'all wouldn't be happy with me, and my voice would go out, so we don't want to do that. Amen. But as I preach, what I do is I'll pick out the major milestones that God shows me. Look at that big tree. Look at this monument. Look, look at this in particular stone. And you may say, well, Brother Sam, you missed something. Yes, I did. Because I'm not going to preach on everything because we'd be here till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But hopefully that as I point out these major monuments that God shows me in the Scripture that it will inspire you to go back and reread and restudy and to look at all those stones that maybe I didn't comment about. So I'm just saying that to say this. I'm not going to comment on every single thing in the book of Exodus. Sometimes I'll take a chapter at a time. Sometimes I may just take a simple verse. But that encourages you to study. Amen? That encourages you to study. Amen? Amen. There you go. All right. So let's do a summary real quick. First 40 years of Moses' life, he lives in the house of the Pharaoh. He lives in luxury. He's got a great education. He wants for nothing. And for the first 40 years, he lives in a great place. And then he gets a desire in his heart to try to help the Hebrew people. He sees that they're being mistreated. So he wants to help them, but he does it the wrong way, and he murders an Egyptian. Well... That, that makes him a wanted man. So if you go in the post office at an Egyptian post office, you'd see Moses' picture up on the wall. And it'd say, wanted, dead or alive, $10,000 reward, wanted Moses. Bring in Moses. So Moses runs. In the next 40 years, from 40 to 80, Moses goes to the desert in a place called Midian. And it's in Midian that he will marry a young lady named Zipporah. And he will have two children, Gershom and Eliezer. And they will be his sons, and he will be a shepherd for the next 40 years. At the age of 80, he has an encounter with God. This encounter with God is called a burning bush experience. 
He sees a bush, a bush burning in the desert, but it's not being consumed. He turns aside, and God speaks to him out of that bush. And he says, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. Well, we've talked over the past few weeks about Moses' response. He began to give excuses. Well, I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. I, I don't speak good. I've got a speech impediment. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, to tell you the truth, God, I don't want to do it. And then he finally comes up and says, God, just send somebody else. And God meets all of his excuses. And finally, Moses decides, I will be obedient to God and do what God's called me to do. And Moses begins to go back to Egypt. Now, understand something. As they've left the end, Zipporah, Gershom, and Eleazar go back to Midian. They don't go to Egypt with Moses. He meets up with Aaron, and Moses and Aaron now go and stand before Pharaoh. Okay? So this is going to be, our, and so that, that's the first five, I mean, four chapters of Exodus right there. Boom. Don't you wish I'd go through the rest of it that quick? <laughs> so now, this morning, we're going to look at, this is my outline, the fickle people, the folly of Pharaoh, the faithfulness of Moses. All right? So we're going to begin with the fickle people. Exodus chapter 4, verse 29. So Moses and Aaron went and they gathered all the elders of the children of Israel. It's like they come to the Hebrews and say, we need a big deacons meeting. All the leaders in the church, we want to gather you up. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and began to worship, and they worshiped God. So imagine for just a moment, okay? Think about this. Think about if Flint Baptist Church had no pastor, no shepherd whatsoever, that, that there began to be bickering among the members, that there was uh, uh, carnality and people uh, enslaved by sin, and, and, and it was just a bad atmosphere, and, and, and it was like everybody was enslaved, and they were bickering and fussing, and the church was carnal at best, and suddenly Moses shows up. He's walked 150 miles from Fort Worth to get to Flint. And he's got a message from God. And he gathers up all the deacons and he said, I've just met with God and God's going to deliver you from bondage. God's going to bring a great revival. God's going to take you from bondage. And you're going to go and have a discipleship course at Mount Sinai like you've never had before. And then I'm leading you to the land that flows with milk and honey. We're going to the promised land. The land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're going to the promised land. And the deacons are getting excited. Praise the Lord. Now, how do we know this? And, 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 and Moses says, well, watch this. And he takes his walking cane and throws it on the ground, and it turns into a cobra. And all the deacons go, ooh. And he reaches down, picks it up, and it turns back into a stick. And they go, ah. Oh. He said, watch this. He takes his hand, sticks it in his coat, and it turns into leprosy. They go, ooh. He goes, watch this. Sticks it back in, pulls it back out, and it's healed. They go, ah. He says, I'm not done. Watch this. And he takes a bucket of water, and he pours clean H2O out on the ground, and it turns into blood. And they're going, wow. And Moses says, God is going to deliver you. And they say, great is Moses. Oh, God, send Moses. We love you, Moses. And they bowed their heads, and they had a revival because Moses was there. Isn't that just wonderful? And they said, Moses is great. Gives us chocolate cake. All oh, hail Moses. He's wonderful. Nobody say anything bad about Moses. And then Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh goes, no, not going to do it. In fact, not only am I not going to let them go, I'm going to make things tougher. 
So if they were tough now, I'm going to make them even tougher. See, right now, the Hebrews have to make, let's say, for instance, a million bricks a day. But Pharaoh said, not only are you going to still make a million bricks, but before we would bring you straw that you would mix in with the clay and put into the bricks, he said, now we're not even going to bring you the straw. So you're going to go out and get the straw and make the bricks and do all your work in the same amount of time, and you're still going to be slaves. So he made things that much tougher on them than they were to begin with, all right? And here's what Pharaoh says. This is the New Living Translation. So Pharaoh, in verse 17, says, he shouted, you're just lazy, lazy. That's why you're saying, let us go offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you, but you still must produce the full quota of bricks. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who were waiting outside for them. So Moses and Aaron are outside the courthouse as the deacons had gone in and talked with Pharaoh. The foreman of the Hebrews said to them, May the Lord judge you and punish you, Moses, for you made us a stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You might as well have put a sword in their hands in excuse to kill us. Wow. How quick Moses went from hero to zero. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Moses. You did a great job, Moses. And the revival fizzles out at the first sign of persecution. When I first entered the ministry, somebody told me, they said, uh, Brother Sam, just letting you know that first-time pastors in Southern Baptist churches, their average tenure is 18 months. I went, wow, that's not very long. I worked at Wiener Schnitzel almost that long. <laughs> they said, well, I'll tell you what, here's how it kind of goes. The first six months, you'll be on a honeymoon. You can do no wrong. Everybody will love you. They'll think you're the smartest guy. You're, you're the next thing to Billy Graham. But then the second month, I mean the second six months, uh, the, the snakes are going to crawl out from other rocks. They're going to tell you what they really think of you. And then they're going to begin to criticize you and tell you what you're doing wrong and, and how you need to improve and how sorry you really are. And, and then the next six months, you're going to be looking to leave. You'll be sending resumes to every friend you've got trying to get out of there. So it's six months on a honeymoon, six months into reality, and six months of trying to leave. Let me tell you something. Sometimes we are just the same way, aren't we? Our faith fizzles so quickly. Boy, we're on fire for Jesus. I'm telling you, I went to the altar, Brother Sam, and I got on fire for Jesus, and I didn't even make it to my car before I lost my temper. Fizzling out of a faith. And that's what happened to these folks. They had a revival very quickly, but then they fizzled out. But our faith, understand, is not based on popularity, amen? Our calling to ministry should not be based upon just fickle ideas or circumstances. I think this scenario is prophetic when it's dealing with the end times. When the disciples asked, what were the signs before you return in Matthew chapter 24, the Olivet Discourse, they said, all right, Lord, what are the signs before you come back and set up your kingdom and everything's going to be wonderful? He said, tribulation. It's going to get tough. It's going to get a whole lot darker before it gets light. So if you think because you've given your heart to Jesus or because Jesus is about to come back that, that, that the road is scattered with rose petals and everything's going to be A-OK -okay and you'll never suffer any persecution, you're kidding yourself because the Bible says in the last day Satan's going to drive wedges, okay? He's going to try to drive a wedge between you and God. He's going to try to drive a wedge between you and other church members. The Bible says that there will be bickering and fighting inside the church, that some brothers and sisters in Christ will turn in Christians thinking they're doing God a favor. Many people's faith will fizzle out. They'll say, listen, I didn't sign up for this. Oh, no, no, no. I, 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 I'm not going to go with this. And, and the Apostle Paul said before that great day of the Lord, before the Lord comes back, you can look for a great falling away to take place. And the word that is used there is an apostasia. It's an apostasy. It's a falling away from the faith. Those that before would come to church, when, when it got unpopular to come to church, they quit coming to church. 
the faith of people today we can oftentimes see is very, very fickle. And the faith of those folks was very fickle. The Bible says that we're called to be steadfast, unmovable, not fickle, not wishy-washy. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby thou lay in wait to deceive. Make up your mind. If Christ is Christ, then serve him. And don't be swayed by the circumstances. The second thing we look at is not only the fickle people, but the folly of Pharaoh. The three big problems with Pharaoh, all right? First of all, this big problem, he thought he was God. Amen? I mean, he truly, if you went to a Pharaoh in Egypt, they would say, we are God. We are deity, and we're going to live forever and forever, and we're going to rule on high. Uh, But that's not unusual. If you go to the Japanese culture, you find that uh, the Japanese emperor considered himself to be deity. He considered himself to be offspring of Amaterasu Amakami, who was the sun god, and he believed that he was the descendant of that. That's why during World War II, those guys would do kamikaze suicide because the emperor told them to do it. They'd do whatever he told them to do. It was like God had told them to do something. The emperor of China was the same thing. He was considered God. The Caesars of Rome considered themselves to be God. Alexander the Great considered himself to be God. And in many cultures, they believe the same thing. In fact, if you look at modern-day secular humanists, they would also say, God is everywhere, therefore we are God. And they believe that they are God. But wasn't that the original temptation of Satan in the Garden of Eden? Isn't that what he lured humans to sin against God with? Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 4. And the serpent said to the woman, If you eat of that fruit, you shall not surely die. For God doth know in the day that you eat thereof that your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as gods. And they went, Wow. Well, we'd like to be a god too. And they ate of the fruit. Pharaoh thought, I am God. I make the rules. I'm the Lord of the Hebrews. I'm the master of my faith. I'm to be worshipped. Nobody can tell me what to do. And it's that pride that gives you that godlike thought that you're smarter than God, that you're better than God, and eventually you'll consider yourself to be God. The second problem is he said, I know not this God. When Moses said, my God said, in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2, Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to. Well, you'd be wise, Pharaoh, to look into who God is. Amen? It's going to save you a lot of trouble. Which leads to the third problem. When God did reveal himself to Pharaoh, Pharaoh still did not humble himself before God. Instead, the Bible says that Pharaoh's heart grew harder and harder and harder the more he saw the hand of Almighty God. Listen, if you're here today or if you're listening online, you're saying, you know, I am genuinely honest. I would like to seek the Lord. I would like to know more about this Jesus Christ and about the God of creation. I'll promise you God will reveal himself to you. But you better be very, very careful because like Pharaoh, your heart can grow harder the more God reveals himself or it can grow softer. I thought about this. If you take a lump of clay And if you take a beeswax candle and you put them out in the hot broiling sun, one bakes very, very hard and the other melts. How's your heart when it comes into contact with the Son of God? Does it grow harder and harder like Pharaoh's or does it melt like a wax candle? Because it's going to do one of those two things. Amen? So, uh, again, our society falls in the same category. You know, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. We talk about this all the time. You can see a woodpecker and go, there's got to be a God. (laughs) That couldn't have just happened. There's no way it could have happened. It's got a shock absorber in its head. (laughs) It's got a tongue that goes from the beak all the way back to the back of its neck. And at the end of it, it's got a barb to jab the little, to, to, to jab the stuff. It's got sticky glue on the end of it. And inside of its mouth, it's got a sticky glue releaser. 
if you look at any bird, you can look at a, a, a bee, you can look at a hummingbird, you can look at a bombardier beetle, you can look at all the animals of the world, and you go, great design demands a great designer. There's got to be a God. He reveals himself to us. And in fact, Romans chapter 1 says, you have but to look in the mirror, and you can tell there's got to be a God. As intricately as we are made, as delicately as we are balanced, there's got to be a great creator to have created human beings with the circulatory system and the pulmonary system and all the different nerve systems that we've got. There's got to be a God. And he's got to have a good sense of humor. If you look into the same mirror I look into. <laughs> but oftentimes when God reveals himself to people, that men professing themselves to be wise become fools. And their hearts grow harder and harder. And the Bible says when they reject that, that eventually God will turn them over to a reprobate mind. Even in the last days, the Bible says when the fifth and the sixth trumpets are sounded in Revelation chapter 9, the creatures we can hardly imagine will come out of the abyss. Uh, when the fifth trumpet is sounded, the bottomless pit is opened up. And out of it come swarms and hordes of, uh, I call them hornets from hell. I don't know what they are. I'm glad I'm not going to be here, amen. And if you're saved, you'll have been raptured by this time. So you're not going to be here. But the Bible says that these hornets from hell torment men for five months. And for five months, people wish they could die, but they're not allowed to die because God ultimately is the altar of life and death. And they gnaw their tongues for pain. And then the Bible says that as the sixth trumpet is blown, that the, from the Euphrates come these demons, and, and, and it's like chariots, 200 millions of, of, of chariot warriors, demonic beings. I don't know what they are, but, but they sound like something I don't want to be around. And the Bible says they kill a third of all mankind. So what's the reaction of the rest of the folks? Do they repent? Do they go, oh, God, please? No, no. The Bible says that they refuse to repent of their sorceries, of their wickedness, of their thieving, of their fornication. They say, I'm not giving up my sin. I will not quit. I will not bow down to Jesus, no matter what he does. What a hard head, amen? But that's what Pharaoh was, and exactly what he did. They refused to repent. So now you have the faithfulness of Moses. Now, get the picture. Moses started out as a great hero. Y'all with me? And then Pharaoh increased the workload on the Hebrews, and Moses was no longer loved. And this is what they said in Exodus 5, 21. And the foreman said to them, May the Lord judge and punish you, Moses, for making a stink before Pharaoh and his officials. They kicked me off Facebook because of you, Brother Sam. I'm not on social media anymore. They won't let me shop at my favorite store because I'm not doing what they asked me to do. You made me stink before Pharaoh and the officials. You've, you might as well have put a sword in their hands to kill us. So the Jews turned quickly and told Moses, why don't you just... Kill us, Moses. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'd been Moses, I'd have been offended. <laughs> I said, fine. I'm going back to Midian. <laughs> I don't need you. You don't love me. I don't love you. I'm going back. Isn't that the way you would react? Unless you're just super spiritual here today. You're in Sunday school, and everybody loves you. Man, you bring them donuts. You bring them pigs in a blanket. You study hard. You pray for them. You, you just present the gospel, and suddenly several of them get up and go, well, we just don't like you anymore. You're making us late for church, and you just talk too much, and you think you know everything, and you jab your finger at us during Sunday school, and we just don't like you anymore. Most of us go, fine. I'll take my donuts and pigs and go somewhere else. But that's not what Moses did. You know what Moses did? He went and prayed for the people. He went before God and he interceded and he stood in the gap for the people that he loved very, very much. 
Wow. There are other times in the wilderness where the children of God would begin to murmur and complain. And God said, listen, I'm going to destroy them all and just start over with you, Moses. And Moses said, oh, God, please don't do that. And Moses would stand in the gap for those who were giving him the worst trouble. What an example to us. That faithful Moses, when he finally put his hand to the plow, said, I'm going to be a servant of God to the very best of my ability. And that's exactly what he did. In conclusion, Jesus said in Luke 6, 962, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If, you, if Jesus really is who he says he is, then we need to put our hand to the plow and look forward and serve Jesus. Quit looking back like Lot's wife. Quit turning around saying, but I want to go back here and, and, and be with my buddies at the bar. Make up your mind. If Jesus is who he says he is, then serve him with your whole heart. Amen. Amen. The Bible says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We need steadfast Christians. Amen. We don't need fickle people. Cold one day and hot the next day. Cold another day and hot the next day. I want to tell you something, moms and dads. Your children need to see steadfast unmovable Christian moms and dads that say, yes, we're going to pray every night. Yes, we're going to church every Sunday. Let me tell you something. The house I grew up in may not have been a perfect house, but every Sunday, my mom and daddy said, we're going to church. There wasn't any, well, we're going to church today. Are we going to church today? We didn't have to ask that question. That was a dumb question. <laughs> you knew you were going to church. You had to be sick and I'm telling you, not a fake sick. You had to be really sick. And brother, if you were sick enough where you couldn't go to church, you were so sick, you didn't do nothing else the rest of the day. In other words, if you thought you was going to miraculously heal about noon, uh-uh. <laughs> no, no, no. You're going to stay sick and you're going to keep drinking that pink Pepto-Bismol all day long. <laughs> Are you steadfast? Or would your Christianity be considered fickle? Hot and cold. It's time we put our hands to the plow and served our Lord. He deserves it. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And God, I thank you that you are real. God, that you love us with a love we can't even understand. You're patient. You're forgiven. You give us chance after chance after chance as you forgive us, oh God. Please help us to be faithful to you, to love you so much that even when persecution comes, that it does not cause us to throw in the towel or to quit. God, may we see the true enemy so that he cannot drive wedges between us as fellow church members or between us and God or between husbands and wives. But God, that we will battle the devil hand in hand till Jesus comes back. For it's in his precious name I pray. Amen.